Cool, do it to it. All right, an incredibly unprofessional thing, Brian. I had started the show playing a game of chess, so if you are king 2127 and are wondering why nerd numbers resigned despite a superior position, it was because I didn't want the clicking noise to go on in the podcast. All right. <laughs> Welcome back to the Box Score Geek Show. Apologies for that intro. We have had a fun week, and some of it's going to make the show, and some of it isn't. So sorry we're going up a, a day late. We've had some technical difficulties, and Dre slacking playing chess instead of giving the intro. Uh, but today's kind of a chef show, which means just a bunch of random topics around the NBA. The NBA regular season is is kind of winding down, which is awesome. There's still a lot of excitement to be had. Will the Lakers with 1% make the playoffs? So we're just going to go over a bunch of topics on our list. Uh, and essentially what we, we've we got is a couple of contracts, some some old oldies but goodies, Eric Bledsoe and Andrew Bogut, uh, some, some more complaining about uh, Anthony Davis. And I, I think we'll find an excuse to talk the Rockets, Brian, just because they're, they're there, but we'll see. Uh, but let's get going. A reminder of the format of the show. We usually do last week on Lost. That's comments on things you, the viewers, have put either on – the show notes, any articles we've written on the boxcoregeeks.com or things we've remembered uh, off of Twitter as an example, just kind of around the NBA, uh, a smorgasbord of topics we have and then maybe a bigger topic uh, or two. This week we only have one. I don't even know if it's a big topic, uh, which is really just some thoughts on Adam Silver's comments on why players are unhappy. Uh, and then a new possible segment idea, but we're going to leave that as a surprise to Brian. So let's get going. All right. I want to give uh, – we, we've made a joke, Brian. I, we made up a fake award earlier this year that I'm going to have to use in the future. We called it the uh, Dunning-Kruger Award, uh, <laughs> which gave to a former Wizards video scout uh, for being so oblivious as to how stupid a comment he made is it was the perfect Dunning-Kruger Award because for those that don't remember, even though we talk at every other show – the Dunning-Kruger effect is basically you are not good enough to know you are bad at something. It takes a certain level of competency in anything to actually have the expertise to do any uh, meta-analysis of how good you are. So people that are really new or novice levels to things tend to overestimate their own abilities. This is a huge problem with the analytics movement. Uh, we might talk one of our favorite sites that has uh, many writers that we – I fully behind aspiring writers, Brian. Let, let me actually take a tangent moment. I have a, a two-year-old. I was talking to a friend about the fun irony of toddlers, which is they're so young and they have no idea how the world works, which which makes them like, how would they, right? Unless you believe in like uh, pre, you know, pre-programmed knowledge, which would be bullshit even if you bought that from a biological standpoint, because biologically there's no way a human could be programmed with knowledge for the world as it exists now. So a toddler has no idea how the world works. The only way they get to learn how the world works is you take them out into the world. But then that means we get to inconvenience all of you other adults with, you know, a screaming thing that doesn't understand how things work that we're teaching. So it's a, it's a, it's an annoying back and forth, right? In order for a toddler to grow up to be a productive member of society, they have to experience society. But while they are learning, they piss everybody else off when, you know, they push all the buttons in the, the door in the elevator or scream or, you know, kick the seat on the, the airplane. But, you know, that that's the trade off we have for society. If we get political Brian on the show, we can bring more of that up. But that's a lot of people, too, when they're learning analytics or writing on the Internet. You watch them and you're like, oh, my God, this is terrible. The hope is they learn what they're doing is wrong and improve or that, you know, heck, we hope we even we've done that. But there's a lot of bad analysis of that. So anyway, that's that's the Dunning-Kruger. And so maybe we'll give out awards to people that lack the self-awareness to properly grade how stupid or bad something they've said is. Uh, this is this is the opposite direction. I want to give an award to someone that just essentially I'm going to call it like, God damn it, uh, you you you've wrecked a post in a comment or maybe God damn it. I, now I have to write that post. Uh, Westchester Bruin made an observation about the Knicks because I think um, I was going over some bad box scores of the week uh, and a player that he brought up uh, was, is it Kevin Knox on the Knicks? Yeah, he's a rookie on the Knicks, yep. And he is playing not just bad, historically bad, horrendously bad, almost negative six wins produced, which is just, is you know, hats off. 
And what Westchester Bruin did is he went over and noticed that in the past eight years, actually se- seven years, and then this would be the eighth year, in the past seven years, in five of those seasons, the Knicks have acquired a player that has, has wound, not necessarily the year they were on the Knicks, but at least some year in the NBA, a player that was the worst wins producer or least valuable player in the NBA. So uh, if you want to get the comment up, I realize I didn't have it up. It's quick up. Enough. Yeah, we have it up right now. So, let, let's run them down. Who are the players? So we have in the 2010-2011 season, it was Andrea Bargnani, who later who, became a Nick. I, and I think he is the all-time worst, like I think career-wise, the worst player the NBA has ever seen. Yeah, per minute he was really bad, but he was allowed to play just so many more minutes than a lot of these bad players. Thanks so to the future uh, Philadelphia 76 ruiner, Colangelo. Anyway, okay. Second 2000- one, 2012-2013, negative Be- uh, Michael Beasley, negative Beasley, was the most negative win <laughs> producer, later became a Nick. He hung around a little bit too, maybe not as bad. 2014-15, it was Jason Smith, who was a current Nick. 2015-16, it was Emmanuel Moutier, later became a Nick. 2017-2018, it was Carmel Anthony, who was previously a Nick. So one thing I want to point out about that trend, Dre, only two of them were current or past. So that means three of them, the Knicks saw this really bad player is like, sign him up. That's the guy I want later yeah. on. You know, like they'd already... Like if you run a player out there and you think, oh, maybe they can get there, and then you look at the body work at the end of the year, like, ah, that didn't work out. The Knicks had that hindsight already, and they still took the plunge on three out of those five players. And then, I mean, obviously we'll give them a little bit of pseudo credit for a rookie, but this this gets back to a, a Donovan Mitchell point I keep hammering home, which is it is just a bad strategy to ever hand the keys to a rookie. And unless you luck out quickly, and by the way, like Luka Doncic and Ben Simmons, as example, who are two players we are like, hell yeah, give them the reins. If they don't look good immediately, you should pull the plug. It, it's interesting because uh, this past week, uh, Donovan Mitchell had a, a pretty good game. And it was, a, I looked at the points of her part, was a good game to take down the Milwaukee Bucks. Now, and I had of course, this was this was funny, Brian, because last season I bashed Donovan Mitchell. I said he didn't deserve rookie of the year and was a below average player. And there are a lot of rabid Utah Jazz fans. Inclu- and and th- what, what made this a little different is it included some beat writers or, or, or at least like sports bloggers, like Sports Illustrated bloggers, uh, to the point that they've either blocked or muted me or I blocked or muted them because it's just like I don't need that nonsense. But the point was, I was like, this guy isn't good. And they were like, well, he's a rookie. He's young. He's improving. Fine. And so someone, after Donovan Mitchell had a good game, someone commented that he had had put up numbers very similar to essentially Vince Carter and Dwayne Wade as sophomores. And I I countered this and noticed Vince Carter and Dwayne Wade as sophomores put up shooting efficiency above average. Donovan Mitchell is still below average. And then, of course, uh, you know, I got some people saying, well, just just wait, just, you know, just you keep waiting. He's going to be good. Like and it's it's like, listen, it's a ridiculous argument when I say a player is not good and you go, well, he's got to be good. How dare you bash them? That's sports is a what have you done for me lately? What are you doing for me now? League. And then just back to the bigger point, the Kevin Knox point is you don't ever want a rookie to be in your plans and in fact that is one of the staples of of like lottery teams that draft draft really young players and are like you're going to be a star and you're going to turn this team around that is foolish thinking and flies in the face of what all of the data has said and the teams that we've liked and even some of the players like Kobe Bryant and Dirk Nowitzki are two examples of players where they were ramped up slowly and so that that has always been our take is that if you're going to have a rookie even if you really like him your plan should be give them time to adapt. And I, I've, I've often had a question in the back of my head about a player like, for instance, Carmelo Anthony. I really wonder what would have happened if Carmelo Anthony had gone to the Detroit Pistons. Because for those that remember, in the, I think, 2002-2003 draft, or just 2003 draft, because it's not obviously multi-season, Darko Milicic went number two in the draft and probably set back teams from looking for players like Duke, Luka Doncic for a decade just because... He was just that bad. There's a fantastic Chauncey Billups interview where he was just like after two practices, it was apparent to everybody that Darko just was not going to work out. And I mean, 
it, it is funny because like Darko was traded away immediately by the Pistons uh, and, and they were at least at the time seemingly a decently run franchise. So it is it is amusing that it is one of the few cases where barring injury and maybe Anthony Bennett later, but the Cleveland Cavaliers were terrible. A top three pick a team just gave up on them immediately. That normally doesn't happen. But Darko Milicic came off the bench, didn't really play a lot the first season if Carmelo Anthony lands on the Detroit Pistons, he's not going to be starting in front of Rashid Wallace. Um, I'm getting the right. I always confuse Rashid Wallace and Rashad Lewis for whatever reason. But yeah, he's not starting in front of Rashid Wallace and Tayshawn Prince. That's just not going to happen. And with Chauncey Billups and Rip Hamilton on the team, Carmelo Anthony's not necessarily even going to be the primarily, primary scoring option. So if Carmelo Anthony joins the Pistons and it takes him two or three seasons and because they've got Carmelo Anthony, maybe the, maybe the Pistons re-sign Ben Wallace and are good for another couple of seasons. That could have been really interesting. And I, I, I've i often wondered if going to the, the Nuggets, because I've dug into these numbers, Melo was the best scoring option on the Nuggets, despite having some really good players like Andre Miller and Marcus Camby and Nene. Nene just wasn't healthy enough for the, re, uh, for the record. If Nene had been healthy, then Nene would have been a good scoring option. He was the best scoring option, so he turned into a volume scorer. And then by the middle of his career, when they had gotten productive scores on that team, he didn't want to give up the ball because I argue he'd learned bad habits. So we're, we're saying that about Kevin Knox. is like he's the worst wins producer in the NBA, and a big part of that is either intentionally if you buy that they're tanking or stupidly, which I Fisdale is such a horrible fucking coach. He's the worst. Uh, this team is just not doing good with players. And I would guess that if you had a truth serum for the Knicks executives, they would probably say it's both. And what I mean by that is they are probably tanking. But then there's also this idea that, well, you just need to play your young players a lot of minutes no matter what, no matter how badly they get destroyed out there. You know, I'm not a coach, so I'm not going to comment on that one way or the other. But I do think there's... Even admit, sorry to cut in, but just I was going to say, Fizdale even admitted with like Tim Hardaway, he's like, his contracts do good. And basically, I think what the Knicks front office was saying is, this is a trade asset. We're giving him too much. If you don't play him, we can't trade him. So yeah. you better be playing him. So anyway, sorry. Exactly. Yeah. So along those lines and, and even on Moody, you know, who again had that terrible year with the nuggets, you know, people might be saying, well, he's been much improved on the Knicks. Well, he was early in the year. We pointed out, wow, he's actually been a way above average early in the year. Well, that's fallen off. Now he's kind of mediocre below average. So to fall the way down, he probably hasn't been as good in the second half of the season, probably regressing in the mean a little bit, and it seems like that is not going to work out for them. Yeah. All right. Another great comment. Uh, this was just uh, an email from Andrew Sutton. We always like, you know, he, he loves sending along his thoughts. Uh, he's co-hosted before, and he has some good ones. He was talking about LeBron James, and I, I definitely might talk this more later on the show, but just noticed, if you essentially look at LeBron James' raw box score, He's about as good as he was last season. Uh, someone on Twitter, I think it's House of Mirth is the person, had a great one where they're just like, even if you're going to be mad at LeBron James's defense, and I have so many thoughts on that, which again might come up later on the show, you can't be shocked that LeBron James's level of effort on defense as a 16th year NBA player isn't the same as it was. You know, he plays second in defensive player of the year voting, uh, I believe back when he was on Miami or Cleveland. You shouldn't be shocked by this. Le LeBron James, you know, really isn't playing that much worse than last season, barring not being on the court for injury. Um, and, you know, he he did basically just say that. Uh, so basically another thing is, you know, three versus four LeBron James. It looks like he's been playing bigger. Uh, and that is I mean, part of that is just younger wings, right? They've got Kuzma, Hart, Ingram. You've got some young wings anyway. Uh, and he basically said getting. If you know, we'll we'll see what happens with Anthony Davis in the future because that's that's a real big question. And if, if this season is done, what's rough is it's injury. What what yeah. really pisses me off about the season is this season was injury to Rondo, Lonzo, and LeBron. And Josh Hart I, as well. I don't know how many games he's missed, but people say yeah, he's been playing hurt. Yeah, they say he's been hurt, and I I just can't I couldn't verify that. But I mean, just straight missed games to those three players, and it always gets me pissed off when any team is like. Well, every team deals with injury. It's like not all injuries are created equal. And yeah. so uh, one of the the fun ideas we've had in the past, this was from Dave Barry, is a metric for a general manager is if you go three seasons without making the playoffs, you're fired as a general manager. 
I have a caveat to that, which is to say, you know, within reason. So if you tell me what, if you come to me and tell me what you expect preseason and it doesn't sound ridiculous, because as an example, if you came up to me preseason and said, we're going to acquire Mello, and if Mello, you know, this is, I'll throw a little shade, see if he listens to whatever, like Arturo. Arturo versus me, Arturo is always way more optimistic than me. And for instance, I'm always way more optimistic than you, Brian. It's it's funny, and I scold the locks and the three bears, where, you know, as an example, Luka Doncic, Arturo, two minutes of preseason play is like, oh my goodness, five-time MVP and a finals MVP at minimum. He seems like, to be a guy that reads a lot of stuff from Europe, to be fair. So he may have but, had... But then I, I see... I see 20 games out of Doncic, I'm like, oh my goodness, future star. And you're like, pretty good. Let's wait and see what happens. Like yeah. that, that's the three take. Um, but, you know, with, within reason, you come up to me and you, 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 you sell me a reasonable story. And then if something derails that, if LeBron James goes down for 20 games, I'm like, you know what? You're, this team is still likely on pace to win 35 to 40 games with where they're at now, which is more games than they've won any of the past five seasons, which should be fine. Um, and you know, I, have just gotta, gotta say, I, I agree with, uh, Andrew Sutton's point here. And then even, even on the defense point, just an annoyance to me is a lot of defense is team defense. And we might discuss that later in the show. Um, another interesting comment that came up uh, on last week's show as well is we, we got into a fun combo discussion about uh, the adjusted production. So essentially the point being your goal as an NBA team should get the best adjusted production. That's irrespective of team as possible. And Todd too made the point that um, basically the distinction between building. So again, Andrew Sutton had another big comment looking at the bucks and, and looking at that, the, the average adjusted production of their top five minutes players is just absurdly good in the NBA. And so he actually had a really good question, which is a very money ball question. What's an adjusted production we'd want to have for an NBA team. And then Todd to respond that and said, I thought this, th- the site made a distinction between building a team minute allocation and an in-season postseason play with Arturo's half-baked theories. None of the, the Bucks are close to players, uh, close to top of the league in minutes plays. They're using their bench. And then he also asked about uh, Enos Cantor and Enos Cantor up. I'm going to, I'm going to punt it Todd, but rest assured we will discuss more Enos Cantor, especially if he gets more play time. But this, this is a funny point about team construction of you want as good of a, production for your squad irrespective of position just looking at the players you play about as high as you can get and then you basically want a regular season and postseason rotation and what this got me thinking about brian i was telling you that i was going to start using more chess metaphors on the show just because it's it's fun is i was calling this the sharp lines thought because what i think happens with certain general managers is they make really good moves in fact this was masai ujiri in denver is he would sign players like JaVale McGee uh, and uh, Costa Kufis. And these are great players. We love them as a box score, box score geeks. And the coach doesn't play him and they don't win as many games. Or, or you know, he signs those two great players and then sign, ha, Al Harrington's on the roster and inexplicably Al Harrington gets the minutes. I called this sharp lines. Uh, the way to explain this is in chess, we are at the point where you have supercomputers that can tell you what the right move to make is. But – there's the term known as a sharp line, which is you can make the correct move, but and you will be winning. The, the chess computer will say you are winning making this move, but by making that move, you essentially have to play perfectly. Where there are some moves that you make where it's a good move, it, it's positionally sound, you know, if this makes any sense. In chess, you can make a move that is positionally sound. It might not be the optimal move, but it's really hard to mess up. Whereas there are moves that you can make that aren't positionally sound that are that put you vastly in the lead, but if you don't play the right sequence of actions, you are going to lose. And in fact, pre-show, Brian, I was mumbling to myself because we had technical difficulties. I was actually playing chess while Brian was debugging it, and I was uh, yelling at some people I was playing. Not not really yelling. I was talking to myself about how they were forgetting about forks and how if you're going to play that move, you really have to remember that a piece is forked, and that means if you move this, you have a discovered attack. So there are 
team strategies that are essentially sharp lines. You're saying, if my coach plays the right set of players and if those players don't have any issues, et cetera, et cetera, I'm going to win. Whereas we, we've had this comment about the Golden State Warriors in the past, Brian, particularly uh, Steve Kerr versus uh, – who, who was the coach? Uh, was it Tyson, Tyson Liu or Tyron Liu? Tyron Liu. Yep. Where I was arguing the Golden State Warriors had a coach-proof roster. Whatever five players you rolled out, because of course they were always going to roll out Steph Curry and Draymond Green. This was pre-Kevin Durant. So as long as you had a lineup with Steph Curry and Draymond Green, pick another three players off that roster and you're fine. Whereas the Cleveland Cavaliers at the time, if you choosing between like Timofey Mozgov and J.R. Smith was a world of difference in production. So from our standpoint on like some of this production discussion, I've really started thinking about as a general manager is – how much should you make your team coach proof? Because getting a bunch of really like wins produce savvy players can end you up in a sharp line where you're like, if, if my coach doesn't use this properly, they're going to lose. Whereas if I just get a bunch of good players that everybody knows is good, uh, my team is fine. Yeah, that's a really interesting analogy. And it makes me think of this um, Sun Sarver article that came out on ESPN today, kind of inside all their dysfunction over the years. And I've heard... I don't know. I don't really want to get into that too much. So we'll just talk about right now. But it's an interesting read that, yeah, I mean, that one of the things that they complained about all these anecdotes about Sarver is that there is a a wall between um, the coaching staff and the front office, basically. So that's something like you're saying would happen. And so, of course, what they really need to do is have a closer relationship, right? The GM and the coach need to actually not be adversarial and say, yeah, We'll get players that you want to play, and if you don't want to play, or, you know, if you don't want to play these players that we've gotten, why are you the coach? You know, like you, you have to be on the same page there, and it seems like that should be obvious, but it, it isn't always in this day and age, and apparently it's not um, to the Suns. Yeah, I agree that anytime there's adversarial management, and th- this 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 sadly isn't unique to the NBA. Uh, a weird comment. Uh, I've been uh, rewatching Babylon Five. It's one of my favorite shows. And uh, J. Michael Straczynski is on Twitter. He answers lots of fan questions. He is a great follow. Is this a very political show, right? That's why you're bringing it up? Uh, that, I, I could. We, we, I, I'm actually going to avoid the – I'm going to stay off that sharp line, Brian, and avoid the okay. political – but Babylon – oh, my goodness. Babylon 5 is is about as subtle as a sledgehammer when it comes to politics, and it definitely <laughs> has like Nazi imagery and all that stuff. And it's, it's funny because on the show, he's just like – there's one point where they're essentially space Nazis and he has them wear armbands and there was like a commentary and he's just like, people are like, maybe that's a little too on the nose. He's like, that's how these things happen. And then you watch real world politics. You're like, Oh yeah. All right. Uh, but anyway, there was some funniness with this show where essentially the, the company that made Babylon five was a subsidiary of WB of the Warner brothers. And there's lots of internal strife between WB and them. And so essentially his show, the rights to his show are basically held, you know, in perpetuity and you, he can't do anything with them. He can't make comics. He can't make new, you know, if he wanted to make new episodes, if another studio, like if, if sci-fi came along and said, we'd like to produce a mini series of Babylon five, they couldn't do it. They've had some failed spinoff attempts, but essentially he's just said the reason this show and some of the, you know, there aren't new releases and all this stuff like special edition Blu-rays and all that is just internal politics. It's, it's just people fighting each other. And that happens all the time in the corporate world. A lot of stuff that people are big fans of Firefly is another example. It's like the reason for it has nothing to do with the smart sound business decision. It's just like factions fighting with each other. And that is, that is a, a real area of, of, you know, why the bad teams in the NBA stay bad, and we see that all the time. The Knicks are one of my favorites. Talk to Art Rondeau at some point with his history with the Knicks and, and all the stuff there in even recent years, like Donnie Walsh versus um, – how did I just drop the the owner's name? Uh, Dolan. Mm-hmm. Like when the GM and the owner and the coach aren't all on the same page, it's like what the hell, and that, that can screw things up. So, But it's it's not unique to the Yeah, NBA. just to go to the absolute extreme with that point, um, there's a big – expose dropped this week in the New Yorker by investigative journalist Jane Mayer called many times maybe the best investigative journalist in America I don't know if that's true but it's this article is all about Fox News and one of the interesting revelations from it there's many 
is that her reporting says that Rupert Murdoch, you know, the owner of Fox, and, you know, he really, he just is into what you're talking about, Dre, like the squabbles of businessmen. And he just wants to make money and he just doesn't really care about whatever else Trump is doing, you know? So it's just folly, you know? It's all ridiculous bullshit that we're in the situation we're in right now. I barely got how those two connect, except that, like, basically, if Richard Murdoch was an owner of an NBA team. He's basically the general manager is saying, let's do this. And he's like, well, no, I don't want to do that. And well, it's just even the most thing, something that may appear to most Americans to be evil, you know, this current regime with this, like, a, you know, there's just a, you know, a complete dread on the inside. It's a little more bumbling than it seems is all. Yeah, well, well yeah, that that is definitely funny. Um, I, I, I've thought about this before. So actually, um, let, let's skip a topic. Um, so let's skip to our third, fourth topic, Andrew Bogut. So is Andrew Bogut officially re-signing with the Warriors? Not officially, but it is unofficially confirmed by everyone. No one's denied it. Okay. Now you were a little more optimistic than me and I'm just going to give my, my layout. We, we've thought in the past, Andrew Bogut was insanely productive. In fact, Right when the Warriors were on the up and up, Patrick released an article, this was five or six years ago, obviously, that said as much credit as players like Draymond Green and Steph Curry were getting, rightfully so, a player everybody was missing was Andrew Bogut because, you know, Andrew Bogut was a former number one pick that had been in his prime, I think, a 15-10 player, right, you know, deserving. I think he got close to a max contract, about a max, and he deserved it. But when he went to the Warriors, of course, he, he basically stepped into a role player role and, you know, it pisses me off that in the NBA, unlike Major League Baseball, where we get really excited about players that accept a role player role, right? You can have a Pedro Martinez and Mariano Rivera go first ballot Hall of Fame because, you know, they basically said, I'm just a hitter. My job is just to hit or I'm just a reliever. My job is just to relieve. In the NBA, if you have a player like Dennis Rodman say, I am a re rebound and D guy, re and D, you know, we have three and D. What about just re and D? Anyway, that was really dumb, Brian. I apologize. But, I like you know. It. Just, okay, just have a have a player like that. We're like, well, I don't know. They're they're a role player. They're they're not as good. Andrew Bogut went to the Warriors and basically said, I'm a role. You know, I'm a I'm a big. I'm a defender and rebounder. I don't need I don't need to score the ball a lot. We've got Curry. I don't need to do all this other stuff. But he was absurdly productive, and we like that. The issue for me is he's old. Uh, this is a, a quote from Creed, and of course many other things since the Creed, the Rocky movie, where Apollo Creed's son asked Rocky who won between him and Apollo. And Rocky says that he beat Apollo and then Creed, Creed's son asks what happened and Rocky's like, nothing happened, age is undefeated. That's just the case in the NBA. Andrew Bogan is years away from playing meaningful minutes and I just don't buy this as a good move. And I even tweeted about it uh, today or yesterday, Brian, where I said, it really makes me sad with all of the good analytics squads teams have and all the players in things like the G League and FIBA, et cetera, that the two strategies, and I, I, I mentioned I've kind of monitored this for fun, the two strategies that teams seem to use midseason for acquiring players on their roster is one of two things. They look for a player one or two years out of the NCAA that was a really good, I'm going to put in quotes, really good senior, meaning they scored over 15 points a game, but a really good senior in the NCAA doesn't mean jack, especially like if you're a senior in the NCAA, you can be a good player and a player we think you draft. But you don't need to just be a good points per game player. You need to be demolishing uh, your competition. I mean, and we can go back to the days of players like, you know, Tim Duncan and Akeem Olajuwon and Dikembe Mutombo, players that played all the way through their college career and look at how dominant they were in their fourth year to say what you should be looking for. You shouldn't be looking for a player that, you know, Average 52% from the field as a big and scored 15 points a game. But NBA teams go for that player instead of looking for underrated gems that we like. Or they go for a really old veteran and, and think about the fact that Carmelo Anthony man, – Carmelo Anthony got like three chances, right? Like that that's ridiculous to me with how bad he's been playing. And now we're Andrew Bogut. And with what we were just saying about like front office strife, I think sometimes what happens is when people make business decisions or analytics decisions, they don't say – what is the best thing for my team to win? Or in Murdoch's case, what is the most correct news thing to do? They go, how do I keep a good personal relationship or I want to hire someone I like? That happens so many times. I don't want to piss off someone I like, so that's how I'm going to choose to, to make my business decision. I need to hire someone, I'm going to hire someone I like. And that just keeps happening. And that that's basically my take for Andrew Bogut. 
a couple years ago, Brian, I might applaud this move, and I'm happy to be proven wrong. But he played two – admittedly, they were productive, but he only played 200 minutes last year with the Lakers. He's been beat up. He's old. There were better players, um, the Warriors, who have actually in the past couple of years been really good at money balling – money balling not expensive bigs, but money balling good bigs. There were better players they could have picked up. Yeah, and I won't complain with you about the process too much here because, well, so first let's say one thing. This is, you know, just a player picked up in free agency after the trade deadline, you know, no no assets were given up, and I don't think it's a player that the Warriors expect to get meaningful minutes really at all, especially in the playoffs, right? So I don't think the team or anyone really expects this type of move to be have an impact, but where could it have an impact I think the thing that you're worried about is the Carmelo Anthony thing, which is where it, we'll just throw him out there and he'll be so bad and they won't stop giving him minutes. Hard well, to see well, that happening I, here. When yeah, he's right. Now, minutes. Example for the Denver Nuggets, similar ideas like Isaiah Thomas, where you're like, yeah, the 10th man on the roster is not going to hurt. Well, I mean, we lost a one point game to the Spurs and I think he went like three for 11 that game. So, yeah. Yeah, and that, that could happen, but I think it's really unlikely for the Warriors. I think they would bury him on the bench or cut him in the playoffs It was if it was a big problem, right? So, And then what about the process part? Well, it was reported that they didn't want to sign a center. They were looking for wings. Wes Matthews was their first buyout option, but he went somewhere else, I guess, where they got more minutes. And it was kind of some other crappy – I won't say crappy. I mean, come on, these are NBA players. These guys are awesome. But guys that aren't going to move the needle necessarily – so like, fine. So it does seem like they just didn't care, wanted to bring him some depth. So yeah, maybe their process wasn't that great. Now, as for the result, though, I will say that I do have a little bit of optimism versus other stuff. And here's the reason for that. Because you're I'm, a Warriors fan? Well, and no, what I, yeah. But what I'm worried about... No, here's what I'm worried about. See, because I'm the ultimate pessimist, like you said earlier in the show, Dre. The, the biggest fear for the Warriors is injuries, basically. If they stay healthy for the rest of the playoffs, for the most part or the rest of the regular season and all the playoffs, they got a you know pretty good chance of hanging in there to repeat, right? It's probably not as high as people think it is. People say it's the third sure thing, but they're probably you know up there with the Bucks in terms of being the favorites, right? So what are the bad scenarios, though, is players, players getting hurt, and they are especially thin in terms of big-bodied centers. And I brought up a Wikipedia page for it, the Warriors roster, they have some tall guys. They have some guys with some long wingspans, but not super tall. They, they don't have a lot of heavy guys, though. They have very thin guys. And we were chatting about this a little. You said there's data saying wingspan matters maybe more than height. I haven't seen any data for weight, so I'm really going on the eye test here. But when I see the Warriors go up against teams that have you know, 270, 80, 90 pound centers that are really bringing the beef, the Warriors get pushed around like guys can really get in there in the offensive rebounds and just rolling to the hoop, you know, without the ball. So what was the Warriors like height and weight situation? Like, you know, without Bogut? Well, let's see, let's, let's sort by weight. Um, no, I'm not Quinn cook. He's the lightest. So cousins, they just brought him in, right? He was out for the most of the year. He's 6'11, 270. Okay. That's a pretty big player. That solves most of the problems I was concerned about. Right. But he hasn't been able to play a ton of minutes yet. And we don't know if he's going to be able to keep it up in the playoffs, right? So he's just one guy, and he's coming off an Achilles. He could be hurt again, too. Derrickson, undrafted rookie, he's not a factor, although he's about around 250. Damon Jones, out of the year. So for most of the year, the Warriors have been running Kevin Durant out there at 240 pounds as their heaviest player, although he is taller than he's listed. He's probably closer to seven feet. His yeah. nickname is the Slim Reaper. He's known for being really thin. Nick Young even had this famous soundbite last year where all I need to do on this team is pass it to the thin guy, and that's it, and we just win. Oh, and the light-skinned guys like Clay Thompson. Anyway, so he's just known as being thin, right? And he's your heaviest guy. So having another big-bodied center on the team, even if they're only going to play you know, 10 to 15 minutes at most, that is some kind of insurance policy that could maybe pay dividends, so I think it's worth it. I'm happy to be wrong, but like, yeah, where, where it frustrates me, this is, like I said, getting into the, the chess metaphor, the, the sharp line, is I think any decent analytics squad should be able to find you some player between the ages of 25 and 30 
for less than two million, that's undervalued. I mean, I, I'm kind of shocked. I think Luka Doncic is going to turn the tides to looking at international players for draft again. Like I said, I think Darko Milicic hurt that, and I think Luka is going to help that. But I'm shocked that like Robert Covington, who we even made fun of him, Sam Hinkie, a little because in Sam Hinkie's letter, he like said he really regretted letting Covington walk out the door, and oh, then eventually right. did, did did get did get him back, and then he turned into a big contract. I'm shocked at the number of people that can't look for good G leaguers or the right players that don't get drafted. I mean, Ben Wallace yeah. was infamously undrafted as well and went on to be great. But it's like I keep watching the players' teams pick up, and I go, even if you were going for a player like Andrew Bogut, uh, an easier name would have been, you know, JaVale McGee at the start of the effing season. Anyway, yeah, sorry. I agree. But, but you know, it, it's it's just amusing to watch teams do this. And then, like I said, it, it essentially boils down to being a sharp line because you're now saying if Bogut comes back healthy, if Bogut doesn't hurt the existing system, if, if, if. And I, and I really hate that because we've seen the alternative happen. You're saying that, right? You're like, I think if this player is bad, the, the Warriors will just shelve him. Whereas I'm seeing the alternative, which is paining me right now, which is Isaiah Thomas is not playing well. I've heard some some fellow Nuggets fans noting that he might be getting in the way of Monty Morris because Monty Morris is recognizing that Isaiah Thomas is a veteran. You know, Isaiah Thomas was an MVP ballot. Can't he placed fifth on the ballot at one point, right? And he's deferring to him, but he shouldn't be, right? And this was like the same kind of argument you might have about a player like Kobe back, you know, what what he did to the Lakers, right? The Lakers get all these young players that I, I now argue none of them turned out good. Not, none of the young crop of talented draft prospect players the Lakers picked up as of yet have turned into a player anywhere near as good as, say, Kyrie Irving or Kevin Love. I mean, I think that's, I don't think it's anything controversial. There's still time, but of course the problem is you're running out of time on LeBron James. But those Lakers players, when they were getting drafted, some of them were playing next to Kobe Bryant, and the coach and everybody else was deferring to Kobe. So instead of these players getting development, they're confused why the management is blowing them off or benching them while they're playing Kobe 30 minutes a game. So I think there's there's definitely something there to saying this could work out, but I just hate, hate, hate when teams try and do that. And then I've seen too many times, like I said, with Isaiah Thomas, they get a player like that, and it actually does cost them a couple games, and they they don't play it right. So that that's my take on the matter. We'll uh, see. Let, I got here's the way I put it, Dre. If we're thinking of like this, you know, the Bayesian scenario, and there's all these different outcomes we could have. I think the vast majority of the outcomes not going to matter at all. There's a few where it could help them, and I think even less where it's going to hurt them. So that's kind of why I think it's okay. Yeah. Well, the, the Nuggets are doing stupid stuff with Isaiah Thomas, so your lead in the conference is safe, and I kind of agree to your point that come playoff time, they're probably going to be all right. Like He's he's not going to be in the rotation then. Uh, let's combine two. So uh, obviously top five box scores of the week actually went up on time on Monday this week, and a player I was happy made the list. Uh, admittedly with some bias, this list had a, had a little bit of a Bucks bias in spots four and five. So usually when I do the top box scores of the week, I use points over par. In some weeks, there's clustering. The best games are just so much better than the rest of the games. It's obvious. And and the top three games were were too easy. It was, uh, you know, the, these three names are going to surprise you, Brian. James Harden, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and Carl Anthony Towns. Those three guys made the top of the list. It wasn't even hard. But I basically gave spots four and five uh, to, or I gave a spot, I gave spot four, I believe to, uh, actually, no, it was, sorry. I messed this up. Mitchell Robinson. I forgot about this. Apologies. Giannis. I lied. Mitchell Robinson for the Knicks had an amazing block game, had six blocks for the Knicks, but I gave spots four and five on the list to Giannis and Eric Bledsoe, which might be a slight Milwaukee Bucks slant. And, uh, Eric Bledsoe, the reason he got it is he got a triple double. And something that happened last week is he was signed to a four year, $70 million deal. And I basically shrugged my shoulders and said, yeah, that, that's a perfectly reasonable move. We think this season he is playing fantastic. And I think this is part of the nice advent of, you know, Maury Ball, three ball, and, you know, him actually playing in a good offense with a coach. Interestingly enough, he doesn't really actually shoot that well from three. He's 31% from three, but he just does shoot pretty well. You know, I think he, he spaces the floor so he gets open and shoots really well from two. Passes the ball all right, does other things okay. So we we think he's a pretty good player. He will be 33 at the end of his contract, but that's more than fine. Uh, basically, because our argument kind of is, uh, I'm going to try and get the Larry Kuhn um, 
CBA FAQ up. But the way I kind of thought about it in my head was you really want to look at you really want to look at getting a 50 win team for the normal NBA salary cap. Now there were a few years ago where that was amazing because the NBA salary cap was 100 million, which meant all you had to do is you took a player's salary divided by two. That's how many wins you wanted out of them. So in that case, with with that method, it would be 35 wins over four years, eight wins a year out of Eric Bledsoe. Another good metric I have in my head is if you look at a player that plays 80 games, 30 minutes a game, average production, they are a six wins a year wins producer. So six wins is an average player. So if you get, you know, basically eight wins is two wins above average, which, you know, that's that's hard. But the other thing is um, the other thing is that the salary cap is going up. So 70 million is less than eight wins a season. So we're basically what what the, the fun factor is is 70 million a season. So for instance in 2021 the salary cap is set to go up to 2118 million. Um so that's just just letting you know it's out. So I'll have to figure out some calculus at some point. But we're asking that's an average player salary for a player that we think right now is significantly above average and even following the standard age curve is going to be above average meaning I have absolutely no problem paying that amount of money. There's a there's a fun book, uh, Scorecasting, I believe it's called, and it had an interesting psychological quirk in it. They were talking – I'm going to compare to another sport, Brian, as I want to do. They were talking golf, and they were noticing an interesting point is if you look at the game of golf, what matters is your final score. You know, you, you want to just have the best score at the end of 18 holes or however many rounds, right, 50 holes. Uh, what standard – is it three or is it three rounds or five rounds? I don't know golf well enough, so apologies. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Um, yeah. The weekend Either. tournaments are three days, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but I don't know if there's pre-rounds. I just don't know. But yeah, basic, basic point is you want to have the lowest score possible. But and So the funny psychological quirk people have is if a player is shooting for an eagle, which is uh, two below par, and they're maybe 30 feet away from the hole, that's an aggressive putt to try and make that putt. But oftentimes they'll take it because they're significant. They're, they're, they're guaranteed to make par on this hole. And if they're right, they get a negative two, and that's awesome. Whereas if a player is 30 feet away from the hole, they might be less aggressive going for, going for a birdie because if they miss – or if they're like shooting for par, they might be less aggressive because they don't want to miss. They want to get par, which is the score on the hole. It's the score you're supposed to make on the hole. But what we notice is – the rational model should just be to say, I want to maximize my strokes and I shouldn't care about par on any given hole. I just want to get the lowest score possible. This gets amusing as I've, I've, I've been bashing one of our old methodologies, which is looking year to year at players' salaries. At age 33, there's a very real chance at 16, 17 million a year, Eric Bledsoe is going to be overpaid. But we're paying Eric Bledsoe 70 million right now, and we're basically saying, can that 70 million essentially get us 35 wins over the next four seasons? And with how good Bledsoe is playing, two years at 10 wins produced, and then two years at eight, and that's not even a problem. So I think I think sometimes because I saw that was the only real criticism I saw of this is that Eric Bledsoe is going to be old by the end of this contract. I think it's more than reasonable when you look at an NBA player's contract to just say one. Do I think I'm going to get the wins that this contract is worth? And two, how hard is it for me to get out of this contract? Because that's another thing. If, if Eric Bledsoe starts declining in year three, year four, you can probably package a $15 million a year deal with a salary cap for an undervalued asset without problems. So this contract was spectacular, and then Eric Bledsoe followed up that day by getting a triple-double. So yeah. wanted to put those two together. Yeah, I like this contract too, and uh, we got. I saw some good notes here from Bobby Marks, which is that um, this salary for the tw for 2019, 2020, which is um, this season, right? Or sorry, next uh, next season. Getting my years confused as we switch over here. Um, it, he's its salary is only going to be the 13th rank among point guards, and that does include free agents Kyrie, Kemba, and D'Angelo Russell, who are all looking pretty good right now. Maybe Kemba's a little bit down. And what the cap hits are going to be is 15.6, scaling up to 19.3 at the end. So it's not, you know, pretty good salary, you know, pretty good salary for them. Um, if we compare this to another point guard that just got a big contract, Chris Paul, we kind of said the same thing about him, right? 
he w- well and s- sort of the same sort of different we don't think he's going to produce the wins that he's going to need to throughout the length of the contract probably to make up for all that money which is a lot more money than this Bledsoe contract by the way but we do think Chris Paul is probably going to get them a lot of wins in the next couple of seasons which is when they are going for the title right the Rockets are like all right let's get this title you know what the Bucks it's the same thing right they have this window of the I mean maybe they can keep it open for four or five years like the Warriors and Cavaliers did but that's really hard to do there's no guarantee with that even of a player as good as Giannis. So for the next couple years with Bledsoe, by the way, is only 29. He's still in his prime. He's only going to be leaving it, you know, a few years from now. Yeah, the, everything points to this being a good move for them. The only, I'd say, downside, he was he was hurt a little bit before this, but he's bounced back and he's having almost a career year this year, Dre, with, um, you know, with the Bucks. And I have a side question about this, too which is that um, you mentioned that comment, and I think it was from Andrew Sutton, with the Bucks f- top five players all looking so good individually. How much does team the team defense adjustment of wins produced played into that? Because when you've got a team like the Bucks with an insane smothering defense and all their players look really good in wins produced, I wonder how much that adjustment is helping them. It's, it's Well, so that's that's the fantastic thing. So as, as a note... Um, we, we've said we're, we're probably going to move back towards separating the positions out more. Though point guard, the nice part is point guard is one of the positions that's safe. So Very good point here. The production for point guards is probably going to remain untouched. But in the future on the site box score geeks, you might notice some changes to power forwards and centers because we agree with that. But so the, the, way, the way we work, as a reminder, the wins produced formula looks at a player's overall production, which – I, I get pissy about this, Brian. I apologize. So thanks for letting me re- recap this. But is essentially just reading the damn rule book of yeah. the NBA and saying, here is how the NBA scores the game. Here is what determines that wins. Every single box score statistic that impacts either change of possession or scoring is attributed to an individual player. As such, we basically believe that. We say... These stats are attributed to the player. Those stats are all translatable to what wins. Here's how much the individual player contributes to wins. There's an aggregate number or a non-adjusted number called – it's called adjusted production per 48, AGJ P48. Then we do – and actually that does include – so there's one pre-thing. So this is what you were talking about. So there's there's one other aspect which is – defense meaning opponent shooting percentage. So this isn't rebounds. This isn't blocks. This isn't steals. This is opponent shooting percentage. What we do is we take the opponent shooting percentage, how good that is above or below league average, and divvy it up based on minutes played on the team. So you're asking, how much is that going to impact Eric Bledsoe's overall production? He is significantly, he's above Brian Star level and he's about to hit Dre Star level. As a reminder what those two are. Brian Star level is twice as good as an average NBA player. Obviously, if you had a team, if you had a team per minute, right? That's the if difference. You had, if, if you had a starting team of you know that played 36 minutes a game, 80 games a, a year, all twice as good as an average NBA team, they'd win 60 to 70 games, no problem. So that's kind of that point. So Brian Star twice as good as an average NBA player. Dre Star, 10 wins in a regular in a regular 82 game season, 10 wins plus. And I just told you six is average. So 10 isn't quite twice as good, but basically if you have one Dre star on an average team, you you almost get yourself to 50 wins. So that's, that's the two difference. He is significantly above Brian star point uh, points over par of 5.2. A Brian star is points over par of 3.1, meaning in an, in a, in a normal game, like the Vegas line, you'd basically expect that player to adjust the Vegas line by plus three. And I'm if saying all that, other players involved in that game on both teams were exactly average. Yeah, basically, yeah. That the, the the way the Vegas line would be adjusted is you start going player by player, and you say, I think Eric Gordon is plus three. I think you know if J.R. Smith was on the team, minus three, something like that. Eric Gordon minus two, something like that. So Eric Bledsoe is significantly above average. The team adjustment, even in the best seasons for a full team, was about plus maybe 10 wins. And that's, that's like top of the top of the top. That's, that's the most absurd lockdown defense, which when they're divvied up by players breaks down to a very minute amount, which means even if we did the, the exact opposite of what you're saying, the bucks are amazingly good at defense. Even if we turned it around 
and made the Bucks a poor defensive team. If we went and said, let's give the Bucks the Warriors offense, let's give the Bucks the Lakers in the last five games or defense, sorry. Let's give the Bucks the the Warriors. Sorry, Brian, I'm confusing too many teams. Let's give the Bucks the Rockets a defense. The Rockets are bottom five in the NBA at defense. Eric Bledsoe would still be well above that Brian Star threshold because it's it's not that big of a hit. So this is an easy, easy, easy move, like I said, with with no – there is no downside. That's that's the funny part. And so the Chris Paul contract, I've kind of brought up this point many, many times, and it's, it's not – Well, before you move on, I just want to crystallize that point because, yeah, this is complicated and I have a tough time with it. So what I, I guess what my question really was is you have the best player in the league this year, Giannis. He's playing ni- over 1,900 minutes so far, um, the most on your team, right? Uh, and we assume he plays insane defense, right? He has over two blocks and he has two steals per, you know, 48 minutes also has 18 rebounds. That helps a lot with, you know, the point is everyone knows Giannis is good, right? So how much is he carrying the other players on the team? Right. And it sounds like you're saying not that much because there are a lot of players (laughs) on the team that get minutes. And even if he gets 1900 minutes, you've got Chris Middleton with 1800 Eric Bledsoe and Brooke Lopez with 1,700. So he, you've got to split up that credit for oh, that a lot was, of players. That was just slightly different. Okay, so I get your, I get your point. So basic, first off, I was saying, irrespective of what you think of, of Eric Bledsoe's defense, his other numbers are good all, Yeah, just because Eric Bledsoe is clearly really good. So it's he and Giannis carrying the rest of the team. Okay, and so the, the question, my, my first opinion on defense is essentially, and I've said this a lot, Brian, what I was just talking about, affecting opponent defensive uh, and I keep messing up words affecting opponent shooting that is a team activity and it requires multiple players playing correctly and you know we, we've seen this Andre Iguodala was known as a lockdown perimeter defender and of course on the Warriors top defense in the league he was on the Nuggets the season before they weren't even close to a top defense in the league Kevin Garnett won defensive player of the year with the Boston Celtics lockdown defense was a bottom 10 defense in the league the year before with the Minnesota Timberwolves one player can't really carry D, but when you have multiple players that play together. Now, on this weird notion of Giannis carrying the Bucks, Giannis, Eric Bledsoe, surprisingly, I, I had always thought Malcolm Brogdon was a was a fine rookie that was going to turn into a fine player. He's playing amazingly well. Uh, even Pat Connaughton this season is is playing really well. I mean, in terms I it's of pronounced Connaughton, say again, Connaughton is how I've heard Connaughton. it said. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So anyway, in terms of carrying, I mean, I would say that's actually what makes this Bucks team remarkable is that while Giannis is an MVP caliber player and that puts them over the top, this team was like a, a 50 would be a 50 win team if Giannis was only a little better than average. And that's why they're special. I mean, I believe their SRS is still close to 10 and that's like it's fallen a little. So where are they at? Uh, I think they're down around eight now. Let's let's bring that up. But just to to keep going, what your point is, what you're saying is, if Giannis is carrying them, it's not on defense alone. It would have to be his gravity on offense to get them all up on offense and defense, basically. And that seems more unlikely. I can't remember if we said this on the show or pre-show, Brian, but we were talking about a popular Matt Moore article last year that I, or two last year or two years ago that, was that I pre-show, kind of, I think rolled my eyes at but essentially this note was everybody knows that um sorry everybody knows that Kawhi is one of the best defenders in the league everybody knows this but allegedly teams were shutting down Kawhi by putting him on an island and by that what they meant was they would have a an offensive player kind of move out and Kawhi would have to guard them and by doing that Kawhi was kind of out of the fray and and you negated him now an obvious point to make is if you have to sacrifice a player on your offense and assumably that player would have to be good at offense for Kawhi to care, is that really negating Kawhi or is that you playing a worse offense, which, you know, I'm sure the, the not Bucks, sorry, the Spurs are fine with. But a bigger point I would give that analysis is Kawhi is limited on what he is able to do on defense, he can only guard one player and you are allowed to pass. And so because of that, Kawhi is limited in how much he can help the defense, no matter how good he is on defense. Um, this this might come up on a later segment of the show. So, I mean, so even what you're saying is if Giannis was responsible for 80% of the D and Bledsoe was responsible for five, 
he's still not carrying that team. They still have some really, really good players. I love it. Maybe it's all about Buttonholzer. He just improved all those Middletons and Brogdons and everything. And Dre, um, to go to your and and but I'm joking there. You want to know? It's really the most likely thing, Dre. All these guys are in their mid twenties and just all of a sudden hit their prime and aren't young anymore. It's probably an age it, thing. It was. I, I agree. There was. There's probably some age. You know, obviously some reversion. Chris Middleton and Eric Bledsoe traditionally have been good players. They looked off sure. their game season. I will say one thing, Buttonholzer, we, we talked D, and D, Ty Willinghans, one of the friends of the show uh, who used to write courtside analysts and write about the Bucks a lot, noted his analysis did seem to say a lot of team defense did seem to be tied to coaching scheme. And we even said, yep. Jason Kidd, according to Crashing the Glass, apparently ran a really, really sharp defense, as in difficult, but ironically, to our point about sharp chess lines, it was difficult to execute, but then also not effective. So worst of two worlds. And then Jason Kidd really didn't shoot the three ball, really hadn't embraced the three ball. So yeah. with Buttonholzer, the Bucks have embraced three ball. They shoot a ton of threes and embraced a different defensive scheme. And those are two things coaches help. And then like you're saying, mid-20s. So it is a perfect kind of uh, merging of everything. And what I'll say about these Bucks, right, is they are currently, they are 24th all-time SRS. So, so when you're asking carrying... Yeah, you can't get to be a top 25 all-time NBA team thanks to one player. That just does not happen. Yeah, no, that's right. And I do have that up now. It is 8.35 SRS. And like you said, that's pretty high. Once you get up into the 10 territory, that's like, you know, in the, the top 10 teams of all time or even better. So that they're still pretty damn good this year. The Warriors are second at 6.3, which, you know, two whole points per game adjusted again. That's a pretty big deal in the NBA. I'll run up the top five for you, Dre, just in case people are curious. Raptors are third at 5.1. Nuggets at 4.7, still holding strong. And the much maligned Boston Celtics are fifth in SRS, Dre, at 4.57, right up there with the Nuggets. It turns out they are their Pythagorean wins are very unlucky. They should have won four more games than they actually have based I've on been their in- body of work. I've been enjoying this time of year with top teams like the Nuggets, like like uh, the Celtics, where people are overreacting to one game losses instead of looking at it. Now, I mean, in the Celtics case, what you can say is this one game loss does hurt playoff seating, right? Because I do think the top of the East with the Bucks, the Raptors, um, Celtics and 76ers is going to be very tough and home court might be the difference. But I do think it's 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 there's a difference between saying this game was rough because it hurt playoff seating and saying, oh, my God, this team is in trouble. And I keep seeing that. So it's Can I just... talk about a few more teams just really quickly? Since, you know, we lose perspective, I think, just watching SportsCenter throughout the week and or whatever you do, read stuff. The Rockets, who have been charging lately, are still 11th and have been kind of getting lucky Pythagorean. So they're kind of middle of the road still. Although we should say improving greatly because they have Fareed now. Paul's back. Carmelo and Anthony's not out of the way. So watch for them to improve, but it's still not all the way there yet. Um, Philadelphia is down to 10th. Uh, they're looking okay. Here's an it- some it- interesting one, though. Utah Jazz is up to 6th in SRS. After starting out the season pretty bad, they've been winning a lot of games, too. They're now 10 games over 500, and their SRS is even better than that. They should be 38 and 25 now. So the Jazz are playing pretty well, just like we thought they would in the preseason. Watch out for them. The enigma to me is the Portland Trailblazers. We've talked about that. It feels like smoke and mirrors, but Nurkic has gotten a lot better. I need to look into the Trailblazers, Dre, in Nurkic, future weeks. If you have an amazing point guard and an amazing centerish player, that's what it is. That's enough on its own. And if we look at a lot of the top teams, you can basically you can basically say that, right? You have like Lowry, or like even just two amazing players like Lowry and Kawhi. Uh, depending on who you want to pick on the 76ers, if Embiid is healthy, he has been dropping. I'm actually a little worried about Embiid, but you know, you have Simmons, Embiid, Butler. A lot of these teams have a bunch of good players. The real, I don't think it's smoke and mirrors on the, on the um, Portland Trailblazers. I think it's just, if you think Nurkic is going to keep it up because we, we always kind of note this about players is when a player has not been productive for most of their career, we get a little skeptical when they look really good. We've loved Damian Lillard. Damian Lillard, we think, is one of, you know, it's he he is a player just like Anthony Davis that routinely shows up in like stupid speculation. Like this team is these teams are really gonna go hard after Damian Lillard in the offseason. Right now it's the Lakers. And I'm like, you're gonna go after one of the top point guards in the <laughs> NBA. 
solid strategy. Oh, this gets me a nice uh, other tangent I wanted to get on uh, Joel Embiid. I've been laughing that Joel Embiid has been ending up in clickbaity headlines for his opinions, and they're such lukewarm opinions because there was a talk, right? This is a fun one, the greatest of all time, right? We see Scottie Pippen come out, and based on who he's trying to impress, clearly he'll either say LeBron or Michael Jordan, right? Scottie Pippen's like, uh, the thing about LeBron James is blah, or the thing about Michael Jordan is blah. So he, he comes out very clickbaity. Uh, Joel Embiid came out at one point and said, you know, my opinion is uh, the greatest of all time is Wilt Chamberlain because you look at all those records he has and a bunch of them haven't been touched. And I think he's just underrated as a greatest of all time. And I'm like, yeah, that's – I mean, you really can't dispute the fact that you had a guy who averaged 50 points a season is still has – you know, still has a lot of Wayne gretzky records. We were all impressed with uh, James Harden. It finally fell at 31, but he had a 31, I believe, game win streak of 30-point games or more, surpassed Michael Jordan. First place was Wilt Chamberlain at over 60. So it's like – I was like, I was like, that is such a non-controversial take, Joel Embiid. Sure, and then he came out recently and said, you know, I think the best player in the league is Kevin Durant. And I went, you think the back-to-back Finals MVP is the best player in the NBA? You the player so, that you want to sign as a free agent next season? I wouldn't mind it. I mean, depending on how many years, but yeah, I wouldn't mind it. No, I'm saying so, Embiid does, right? Embiid is saying that, so Durant will come over. I, I, that's I, what I'm saying. Like, Embiid, like LeBron took him first in the All Star game. Uh, who? I mean, why? I mean, if it's one or two years, why wouldn't you? So it's like such so non-controversial takes. So the same thing when you're calling Damian Lillard a, a top acquisition target, I'm just like that is such a lukewarm take. Yeah, the real question about the Portland Trail Blazers is if you believe Amin was healthy, because this is another very similar to the Bucks with yeah. like Chris Middleton. Amin was a player we really liked, thought he was productive, great role player, hate that term. Had an off year last season, seems to have come back. Nurkic is a player, let, let's just look at this really quick, Brian, because this is a fun team to examine. I know he was bad for the Nuggets. I know he was a he was a below average player for the first, he was like below average as a rookie, really bad his second year, really bad his third year. Now, what's funny is he goes to Portland, he looked really amazing out of the gate, then he got injured. It was like the worst of both worlds. What happened is he got traded from the Nuggets to the Portland Trailblazers. I was like, good riddance. He sucks. Looked amazing for Portland. And I was like, I'm going to shut up now. And then he got injured. So both Portland and the Nuggets didn't make the playoffs that season. Part, part, and, and thanks thanks to that trade. Getting them Nurkic made them better. And I think they won a head-to-head matchup against the Denver Nuggets. So the Nuggets fell out of the playoffs. And then Nurkic got injured. They didn't make the playoffs. He came back the next season didn't look amazing, but he's coming back from injury. And now this season, he seems to be healthy and amazing. So the question is if you think he's real. And I mean, he falls under this weird criteria we've given before, which is if by a player's fourth season, you haven't seen anything worth going for, you exactly. should give up on him. And what did Nurkic do? Year one, not not great. Above average for a rookie, but not great. Year two, horrible. Year three, horrible for the Nuggets, but good for the Blazers. Year four, above average for the Blazers. So you think Nurkic is real, then the Portland Trailblazers are real. That's yeah, and I've been pretty down on Nurkic too, just for that reason. And I, you know, we're showing it here on the screen. So that time in 2016-17, when he got traded to the Blazers and played well, that was 584 minutes of him playing really well. And up until this season, those are the only five minutes in his 500 minutes, or let's say 600 minutes in his career that he'd ever really played well before. So we were suspicious. Well, that's not really the true him, right? Now that he's got almost 1,700 minutes this season of like top, you know, top, top play. Um, yeah, it looks like he's for real. And going back to my point on weight, Dre, um, I guess I'm looking for the thick, you know, thick players today. He is 275. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of guy that can it's, dominate down low. Goodness. And he is, if, if you believe, even if you believe him, him last season, which was above average big, you know, that's what we always say. He is signed to such a cheap contract. He is signed to $12 million a year through 2022. He's only going to be 27 then. So, I mean, the, the Blazers are in a, are in a really good spot right now. I think they, they're probably going to have to replace Aminu. I think he's getting up there in age, but yeah, I, I think they're for real. The other thing I'll say is Evan Turner, who I think is their first, yeah, he's their first guard off the bench. He's been okay off and on times, having a pretty good year as a backup. And Jake Lehman, as this young, you know, power forward kind of out of nowhere, has been really good. So they've, you know, they've had some good, uh, 
good additions. And again, maybe the coach is an issue here. Uh, their coach is Terry Stotts. I think they take a lot of threes as well, Dre. So maybe, yeah, maybe that's part of it. I did want to to wrap up one point when we were kind of talking the Eric Bledsoe contract and even like what I just said about uh, Nurkic because Nurkic's contract is so not sharp, right? It's 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 basically um, I'd call it like coach proof and even GM proof, right? Because there there are also some contracts like Chris Paul's contract I think is a sharp contract because we think in two or three seasons he's not going to be worth it, and what Daryl Morey does with that contract or how he works within the salary cap around that contract is going to be huge. As a, as a past example, the Lakers with Kobe Bryant's ballooning contract just sucked, right? You, you couldn't handle giving almost half of their cap space to one player. So Nurkic, for instance, and Bledsoe, I think they, they have both coach-proof and GM-proof contracts. You can't really mess that up. Chris Paul, I'm going to call it like a blitz scale contract, which is really interesting. We, it we, is. Oh, that's such a good. We've really been loving talking about Chris Ye, um, who wrote the, you know, co-wrote the Amazon New York Times bestseller Blitz Scaling, which talks about the Silicon Valley mindset of how you basically win in, you know, fields that are kind of almost a winner take all field where getting to market first and expanding quickly is really key. And so like an example like Uber, Airbnb, these are examples. You can say whatever you want about the ethics of the company, but the game of winning that marketplace is huge. Interestingly, Lyft just went IPO before Uber, but your point is taken. Those two were battling for it the whole time. Yeah, battling for Mark Thomas. And it's funny because Chris wrote a book called The Alliance, which is about handling short-term employees and the relationship they would have they should have with their employers such that it is mutually beneficial where you're basically realizing that your employee is probably going to be gone in a year or two and that the employer is also going to have to be responsible for training and integrating that employee so how do you have them work together such that the employer gets what they want the employee gets what they want and again this relates to silicon valley because there's a lot of turnovers example i lasted two years at google and i was like top half, top third in seniority at the company by the time I left because there's just so much churn. And that that seems to relate amazingly well to the NBA, right, where you have players on two- to four-year deals and they're going to want to get their money and leave and cap space things. So it's like how to deal with short-term employees such that they help you and you help them. That seemed to be like carbon copy, carbon cutout made for the NBA. When I was reading about the premise of blitzscaling, I went, well, trying to win an entire industry – doesn't seem to relate to the NBA because it's so short term, right? We we kind of you've said this, Brian, and I've re- aped you a lot about it. You basically said the five year plan in the NBA is bullshit. That thinking is. ahead is just the wrong frame of mind, and I agree. But there is a very winner takes all mentality to sports, obviously with championships or or being a contender. And so in that case, Chris Paul is a player where you're like, I am going to spend my money inefficiently because winning these games to win, to get into the right playoff spot, to possibly have a chance of winning, that trumps being intelligent and getting like 10 second round picks and drafting wisely and looking at them over the next 10 years. And that's essentially Chris Paul. So I at least wanted to, to wrap that point off up on like the two types of contracts we're okay with are basically easy routine line chess ones, which I'll call like GM proof and coach proof contracts, right? You sign a player between the ages of 25 and 30. You make sure that divide their number by two and it's over 50, right? You make sure they have productive skills. They fill up the Brian bins of productivity or they're a blitz scaler, meaning they, and that means they have to be an elite player. Like LeBron James and Chris Paul are two examples of this. There's some very real risk that they're going to fall off and not be worth their contract in a year or two but they get you over the hump to being a title this year. Those are the two types of contracts we like in the NBA. Yeah, that's interesting. So you're saying the Silicon Valley equivalence of a super team is that blitzscaling mentality. That that's that's really funny. Now, can I ask you a question about the alliance because I haven't read it and it might add a little bit of nuance here. It's been a few years since I've read it, so we'll see uh, if Chris if Chris hops yeah. in the comments. Sorry, Chris, hi. I haven't I haven't read it yet. All right, but, but go for it. Um, so one of the so one of the principles of it, and you, what you were saying is, yeah, we need to not think about a business as a family. We, it needs to be, we need to be more real, realistic. One of the terms they use is tours of duty, right? We are going to say, you know, you're going to, it's like enlisting the army for a year or two, and you're, we're going to accomplish this much together, you know, as a company and an employee, and we're going to reevaluate at that point. Now, one of the, that's one type of 
role you could have as an employee. But another is, I can't remember the term for it. It's something like a foundational employee that like, yeah, you're going to be the core of this company and we do expect you to be here for five years plus when we when we bring you in. That's going to be part of our negotiation because part of this is transparency, right? Being transparent about what we're going to do over the next few years. So Chris Paul would fit in into that alliance model as well as they're like, look, Chris Paul, these ne- these first few years, these are most important so we're going to sign you up for the long haul and um, we're going to have you here all this time, even though we need to do this, you know, win these championships right now. Interesting because I think that is where a lot of NBA teams fall apart. And then there's also weirdness. So we've talked like we, we love Manu Ginobili. We think the sixth man of the year award should be renamed the Manu Ginobili award, even though we only won it like once, which is explains there are so many awards. You look at how many times a player or coach won it and you just go, oh, the, co- the award is bullshit. <laughs> But, but with that being said, Manu Ginobili was a player that was willing to accept – they were transparent about the role they wanted and he was willing to accept it. Now, remember Carmelo Anthony when he goes to Oklahoma or even goes to, to the Rockets was like, I don't want to come off the bench. Or then even said he accepted he was coming off the bench in, in uh, Houston and then very clearly did not want to come off the bench. I think where there is a lack of – lack of like where the – employee and employer view themselves as where problems happen. And that was what the Alliance is trying to fix. And so the interesting part to me about Chris Paul in that realm is I think he said, I'm a max contract guy. I want the max. I'm going to be a huge part of this franchise's success. Whereas Daryl Morey, if he was us at least would think, okay, you're good for two or three seasons. Then I'm probably going to try and flip you. Mm. And there probably is a schism in how they view each other. And that's, we see that happen all the time in, in, in NBA teams or the NBA players where, where suddenly they're not the number one player and you don't want them starting and you want them coming off the bench. Or even if you gave them this big contract, you don't think they deserve the minutes. And so to that point about is Chris Paul an alliance player, I think he's a blitzscaling player if he's us. And I think the unfortunate part is I doubt there was that transparency and, and, you know, if he falls off a bit, either the Rockets are just going to suffer, do the same thing that the Lakers did with Kobe, just keep giving him minutes, even if he's not as productive and there are young up-and-comers under him that should be playing, or there's going to be you know, a contentious breakup. That's, that's my prediction, but who knows? Yeah, based on what I know about the NBA in general, I think you're right. Although, you know, maybe good guy Maury didn't do it, but you're probably right. All right, let, let's let's uh, just do a quick lightning round recap of this last point just because it reinforces something I think I said earlier. You noticed a fan-cited article uh, which was looking at zone defense and basically saying that zone defense is more effective than not was, I think, the, uh, the long and the short of The premise of the article is a few NBA teams, a very small number, have stumbled on playing up to like 10% of their possession of zone defense and actually had some effectiveness – Having, you know, over like 2,000 possessions, I think, getting, you know, nine in the 0.95, 0.96 range points per possession. Whereas we say this benchmark is one point per possession, right? You want to be over that if you're a good scoring. It's it's actually been, you know, there's been inflation in the NBA that's been creeping up. Oh, so the zone is even better than Dre. Yeah, I mean, that that's actually below one points per possession is, is freaking fantastic because I was looking this up the other day. NBA average true shooting is 56%, which means uh, what what 1.12, essentially 1.12 points per true shot. So that's that's really really good, and that just reinforces what I was saying. So that's why I'm, I'm gonna ch- I haven't read the article in depth clearly, but I'm going to at least gloss over it instead of just skipping it, which is what I was thinking of doing because we're almost done. Because I'm saying it reinforces a point I was making about defense in general, which is to play good. defense defense as an affecting opponent shooting percentage is a team activity. One player is not enough to do it on their own. Yeah. So the main reason I brought this up is just to see, will this catch on? Will this be a trend or will it just die, you know, by the end of the season? Um, These two teams I mentioned, and it's the Nets are playing at 9% of the time, the Heat 8.9%. So it's even under (laughs) 10%. The rest are all in the four, you know, to 1% range. So it's not really a real thing yet, but it's interesting. And the coaching um, explanation they give for it is that no one, no offenses in the league right now face the zone. So it's just a change up and they just don't know what to do when they face it. So, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. Well, basically, that was the argument for Jason Kidd's amazing 
early defense with the Bucks, yeah. and then why it fell out of favor is that people weren't used to it, and then as soon as they got used to it. So, yeah, we'll, I'll have to see what happens there. Um, I don't really um, – I was just going to say we were, we were discussing maybe we wanted to talk about uh, Adam Silver. I haven't really read any of his uh, interviews at Sloan, which which happened this last week. Uh, you know, We didn't attend, but we'll, we'll see if we do any content around it. But Adam Silver at Sloan made a kind of a weird comment that I at least wanted to address – and maybe we'll talk about it more where he said, you know, modern NBA players, they just really seem unhappy. And, you know, I, I think it's because they're lacking a camaraderie that old teams used to have. You know, their, their heads are just they, they all have headphones on and they're all silent on the bus and there's a lack of camaraderie. And maybe I mean, there, there might be something to that. We, we really don't know how modern technology does affect interaction. And there is a lot of question about that. And, you know, older, older people, older generations did have more community and stuff like that. The other the other side that made me pissed off and I did tweet about it is I was basically like players are really upset they're not allowed to play where they want to play. And so you have all these players, you have the Carl Anthony Towns, the Anthony Davises, the Jimmy Butlers that are starting to kind of get upset. And maybe like getting rid of the maybe like the camaraderie would happen if you let people play where and with people they wanted to play as opposed to forcing them so that that was kind of my flippant response. We might revisit that more. I was going to give my last segment, Brian, uh, my last day. I was going to call it, uh, you know, like Brian takes a pitch. And so the basic point is I had two ideas for an article this week, and I think I'm going to try and make sure I write one. I was going to pitch both of them to you, and basically you decide. Maybe in the future we can do something where we pitch the article to, you know, the audience. And they decide, but we're going to start with you. All right. Your people talk to my people. We'll do lunch. Okay. But well, let's start. I'll pitch them to you on, okay. on so people at least hear, and then and then we'll see what you say. Let's go. Two article ideas. I was basically calling it LeBron James, Los Angeles Lakers. I, I hate to um, bias you, but a lot of what's happened in the last couple of days probably means I'm going to try and nudge you into this is probably the right article. Okay. But basically just examining the Lakers, exactly what Andrew Sutton said in his comment. When we look at this Lakers squad, they've been horrible for five years. They 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 had multiple – attempts in the draft lottery where they they struck out i'm really pissed you know people are getting mad at like them letting go of julius randall and d'angelo russell and julius randall's an above average big but he's you know basically tyson chandler and javel mcgee are fine so it's not like we're, we're missing out on them there and not only that like letting um i think uh letting larry nance go as an example who actually was a good player but wasn't even a lottery player let them pick up rajon rondo which you know they needed they didn't need a big they needed a guard because of lonzo ball being out this team was not a good team the young assets they picked up were were not good or not healthy one of the two and like for instance d'angelo russell it's been, it's been making me laugh so much to see people go like oh my god he's an all-star and even he's going oh the best thing for me was leaving the lakers it's like you suck you just take a lot of shots it's yeah it's he's so not the it, you want De'Aaron fox for guy, point guards to start with de yeah d'angelo russell De'Aaron fox ended up being the good one this team was not good. There was not a pro that, you know, there was, there were some bright spots in this core, which I think we talked about, you know, pre-show like Lonzo and Josh Hart looked really good. And maybe if Kyle Kuzma had the upside we saw earlier, but LeBron James is playing great. The veteran players he assigned, he, you know, helped recruit have been playing good. I will say Zubats was just freaking baffling that that was just a flat mistake I, I can give you most of the other players you know letting go of some of the players that were traded to the cleveland cavaliers last season essentially let them acquire kcp and then you know essentially afford lebron james so that's that's fine even like i said letting go of larry nance gave the money for rajon rondo that's fine zubats no damn sense that was just a mistake but for the most part this team especially going into the all-star break had a shot at the playoffs barring injury. And it's it's really weird to see the turn on people going, it was obvious this was going to be a train wreck from the start. GM LeBron is mucking things up. And I'm basically going, this was a below average team that unless you had a breakout season from two or more of the young players, had no shot at the playoffs that was really close to the playoffs this season. Still has a really, 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 really outside chance. But it all just came down to health. And I, I'm kind of yeah. mad at the post hoc narrative we're getting. So that's that's article one. Article yeah, two. That's a good article, Dre. I okay. I won't say anything yet. Let's see. You're in both. Fine. Article two uh, <laughs> was baseball versus basketball. This is one of my my favorite kind of things. I've talked about this before. I've talked about how defense is more similar in baseball and basketball than people think. People say baseball is a one on one defensive activity. That's absolutely not true, right? There's a pitcher, a catcher, a fielder, and usually a, a player to throw to. Sometimes is the cutoff man. So the entire team gets involved in the defense and. Uh, 
essentially I would argue that for baseball versus basketball, the major difference is usage. In, in baseball, you are only allowed to use one ninth of the possessions. In basketball, James Harden can take every shot that he wants to, and then on the few shots he can't, he can assist. And basically, I know like uh, Kelly Scalette on Twitter just notes how many finishing possessions, either via scoring or assist, James Harden is a part of, and it is it is absolutely ridiculous. But so baseball versus basketball, we've had some players, Manny Machado and Bryce Harper recently have signed these massive $300 million contracts over a decade. And I will say the metric is probably not correct. Wins above average at, at baseball press or baseball reference, not baseball press, but at baseball reference, I was looking at them. And what interested me was you're able to do a little bit of math on wins above average. It's the metric they have there. So a baseball season is 162 games. A basketball season is 80. So you take a player's baseball wins above average. You divide it in half. And that's their basketball would be like if it was a basketball season. And then, as I was mentioning earlier, an average player, if they got like normal minutes, 80 games, 30 minutes a game, is about a six-win player. You take a player, you subtract six from it, and that's like what their wins above average would be. It's not quite right because, of course, what you'd really do is you'd subtract average for the same minutes. But I'm even just saying if you want to do an average – just imagine an, an imaginary average starter – that's going to get about 30 minutes a game, 80 games a season. That's six wins. You, sub you can subtract that off. And so some great players like LeBron James and some of his best seasons is essentially 16 to 18 wins above average, which, you know, that's a 58-win team on its own, right, with just LeBron James. LeBron James makes you a contender with an average squad. I was looking at some of these players like Machado, like Bryce Harper, and essentially Bryce Harper, first off, has not played well in a few seasons, but – in his best season was an eight wins above average player. And the player I compared him to that was kind of amusing was he was essentially like Thabo Cephalosha a few seasons ago or Derek Favors, right? Like Bryce Harper, who just signed one of the most lucrative deals in Major League Baseball, is essentially a mid-tier role player in the NBA. And even looking at like Barry Bonds, this one I loved. Barry Bonds in his best, best season, which was I think 2002, he was – the same as Kobe Bryant. Now, of course, people are going to say, Kobe Bryant, MVP. No, in 2002, Kobe Bryant was like a 10 wins produced player, which was good, but was not taking you to the next level, right? That's Shaq with plus 20 wins. So essentially, the best, best players that we acknowledge, Barry Bonds, that we acknowledge as the best players in baseball are so laughably below how much players matter in basketball. And I just, I found that amusing when you're, when you're making those comparisons, like, oh my goodness, people are like, Manny Machado is going to help us out. And I was like, oh, he gained you three wins, which, you know, I mean, it's imagine you being excited at least back in the day. And we still thought he was good, Brian. Imagine you being excited if your team said, hey, we're spending 30 million a year on Jay Crowder, how you would respond. And that's, that's baseball. So it, it was, it was funny to watch. So those are my two article ideas. Um, I, I'm probably going to try and write at least one of them this week, and I figured I'd see what you thought. I will comment on both of your article ideas. I have a tangent first, however. I love it. That's such which, a great thing. To do. So I'm, I'm a I know you'd appreciate that. The tangent is, so I went to my baseball friends on this because I was curious when you were talking about that. And I the basically the question I posed them is pretty similar to what you're saying here, which is, what are marginal wins in the regular season in baseball actually worth? And you laid out a lot of reasons why they might be less valuable than the contracts that they are. And their response was something to the effect of, you can't compare baseball to the other sports because the regular season in baseball matters way more than in basketball. Mm -hmm. A lot less teams, even though there's the same number of teams roughly, a lot less teams make the playoffs and um that was that was basically like oh and here's the second part of it that in the re in the regular season in in mlb and again this is an argument i was told i know jack shit about baseball so this argument goes the regular season the mlb hitting wins hitting is more consistent and pitchers just don't pitch as often hitters are out there every day hitting wins in the regular season so that, and that's why you'd sign a hitter, you know, to get these marginal wins, right? And then once you get to the postseason, though, because this is what we always talk about, right, in the NBA, we don't give a shit. About, oh, I'll just finish up real fast. But we don't give a shit about the regular season in the NBA if you're a title contender, right? We just care about your top five players that are going to be in the rotation of the playoffs. Your seventh and eighth guys, 
we don't care if they help you win in the regular season. But in baseball, you might care about that because what wins in the postseason there is pitching and getting lucky hot pitching. And that's no, no, more I, of a crapshoot. So I, that's I, the I, argument. I'm interested I'm to hear really, what you think. really curious about that. Well, I mean, I could, I could even buy, for instance, with pitching – in the postseason, because you know who you're playing and you know know that you can really study up, whereas in the regular season you're going to be in on the, the road. Extreme example, Dre. Sorry to cut in. Is the Arizona Diamondbacks right? They were crap during the regular season when they won their title, but they just had two hot pitchers, Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling, like carry them the whole postseason. That's the most dramatic example I can think of. Interesting. Okay, I'm definitely going to have to look into that. Okay, and you're, do you have another tangent, or was that the only one? That's my only tangent, so I'm ready to talk about your two topics now. So or at what least I, what I would say more is which one you would prefer, because then that way we, yeah. we're well power at this point. We can wrap up the show, and then we'll see if people agree or disagree with you. So it's a complex answer. What I would say is the one that is most interesting to me that personally that I would want to read the most is baseball versus basketball because I would want to see all those numbers you just talked about spelled out, you know, on paper or on screen, whatever it is, you know, how, how the, the season being twice as long matters, where all that, all that lays out that the numbers themselves for this are very interesting to me. So I'd love, I'd love to see that. However, I think the um, Lakers article would probably get more, you know, generate more cheap heat, maybe more traffic because you're basically going to be bashing Kuzma and Ingram. And I guess the Kuzma bashing is starting to catch up, so we could pat ourselves on the back there. And that, But then, you know, I think people are mostly agreeing with um, Snoop Dogg's rant. Did you see that? <laughs> Stop when he said he was selling his tickets for nothing. He went on a profanity-laced tirade saying they need to fire Luke Walton and trade the whole team. So um, I think... Yeah, just because most people on NBA Twitter agree with Snoop Dogg, you would generate a lot of cheap heat with this article. Although it's in reality not cheap heat, it's real, but it's perceived as cheap heat. Can I notice a weird <laughs> point on that? The the trade the blow it all the blow it all up strategy is so popular for bad teams, and there's three weird takes to that for me. One is if you have a really shitty team and you're like just trade it all away, the the NBA is even more restrictive than most things because. In the NBA, like if, if I have something in my house that's garbage, I can throw it away or, you know, just give it away, right? I can say, hey, I can go on Craigslist free and say, I have a broken recumbent bike. Do you want it? And I have had someone break down on a voicemail because the recumbent bike was given away before they had a chance to look at it. And it was broken? It was broken. Interesting. People are weird, Brian. I can do that. In basketball, you have to trade it such that their salaries match up or there's an, exe an exemption. So I can't even give away bad players. So my players are bad, and the only way I can get rid of them is if I take something back. And if my team is bad, why would people trade? Now, of course, we do agree that there are arbitrage opportunities, meaning you can trade undervalued play, overrated players for undervalued assets. But that's the first thing, right? You're like, trade away that bad team. It's like, well, I have to either find someone stupid or take back more crap. And the second is, they're like, we have to blow it all up. Well, as soon as you're having a fire sale and giving up the whole team, you, you drop the value. So it always amuses me when people think that's a reasonable solution. They're like, your team is really bad. You're like, I agree. They're like, the solution is to get rid of it all and start over. You're like, well, I can't start over from scratch. That's against the rules. And as soon as I'm trying to do what you want, all I can really do is acquire bad players in return or sell below value or take many, many years to do it, or I could actually just start signing good players. So I think I think it all boils down to what happens. For the Lakers, like if Anthony Davis winds up there next season, obviously everything's fine. <laughs> yeah, and and that's right. Um it, I'm just thinking back to that, you know, again, we were talking about before the season versus now. We had that great show with Lakers expert Chris Ye, <laughs> who we've already talked about a lot on this show, who wrote the Alliance and Blitzscaling. Um I feel like Chris and I, and you as well, for that matter, all three of us were in agreement. We loved a lot of the Lakers players. We loved whatever the GM had done, whether it be LeBron or someone else. And I, I don't want to change anything I said. Even though the Lakers are going to miss the playoffs and we shot, thought it was a sure thing, I think all of our analysis was right on point there. All the players we thought were good were going to do well, and all the players that sucked, sucked. When we say we really like Rajon Rondo... Josh Hart, Lonzo Ball, uh, LeBron, Bale McGee, and those were our big names, right? We were like, KCP is above average. We'll see if he keeps it up. 
When we list those five players and the healthiest one is JaVale McGee, I more than fine just throw up my hands and go, you got me. Yeah. Yeah, and and you're right. And this is, again, like players are who they are in general. Um, they can be put into bad situations and not succeed. But if you have, you know, good players in the past and you put a bunch of them together and there's at least competent coaching, you know, they're probably going to do fine. And that was definitely the case with the Lakers until they had all these injuries. Nice. All right. Well, I don't have anything else to say, so I'll let you get the last word, Brian, and then I'll uh, send us out. Um, yeah, I don't think I have uh, too many shout outs today. Um, we just haven't looked into anything for Sloan. I haven't read any of the papers or watched any of the panels on video. I obviously didn't go. So maybe we'll talk about that, that more in the future. Maybe we won't. I was a little more interested in the papers, I think, than you were, Dre. But even then, I was kind of like, I don't think any of these are going to reveal anything about the NBA and more just be like fun learning stuff. So I don't know. I might look at the machine learning paper just to see. But, you know, a a as happens in, in general, Brian, whenever you send me to look at something, I get angry at you because <laughs> but but I'll, I'll, I'll stay out. I'll stay optimistic. Maybe it's and okay. I should say the um, to explain what you're talking about. There's a few machine learning papers, but the NBA one was about trying to have machines learn what how like all players have ever moved, like their player movement based on this, the data we have from sports VU now from several years. So I don't know what they're going to try to prove in that. Like, are you going to write a machine? You're going to get some machine that's going to tell you what the best defensive and offensive sets are. I don't know. So that one's a little intriguing to me, but yeah, it does seem sketchy. Well, what, what, what's been amusing to me in general about Sloan papers, this has been an MO for years and including some of the last machine learning papers of theirs that I looked at in depth is basically chapter one of the paper is here is a model that's not very good. And then chapter two is <laughs> now we are going to use the model to look in intricate detail. So it's, it's kind of like going, I have this, I have this cracked hour or cracked telescope that can't see very far. And then you're like, step two, I'm going to try and describe the rings of Jupiter to you. And you're like, that makes absolutely no Can sense. Can I throw out a mission to the commenters, Dre? Anyone out there who listened to this episode that has read any of those Sloan papers or seen any of the panels that they really like or dislike, I would love to hear about it in the comments or on Twitter. Yeah, that's it. Those are all my shout outs. I will counter Brian and say you, you can would not. <laughs> You, you, guys, you guys are sketchy on con – like basically what I love about the Box Reeks comments is it's like it's very uh, boom or bust. And when it's boom, I tend to like it because then it like devolves into like Wilt Chamberlain versus Bill Russell because you guys are the best commenters on the web. Only reason I haven't gotten rid of the comment section. So I'm like if this is going to be an article that produces a boom period of, of comments, I'm going to be very depressed if it's about Sloan articles unless the Sloan articles happen to be good. All right. Well, anyway, that has been our show. If you found us not through the site, you can find us at BoxScoreGeeks.com. Uh, we go live usually every Monday, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unless there's weirdness going on. Apologies for that. Uh, and you can catch uh, recaps on, tw or what is it, a uh, channel YouTube on Nerd Numbers. And then, of course, we are on iTunes and Stitch, the Box for Geek Show. I've been your host, Ray Alvarez. You can find me in most places, including chess.com, which I was doing when we started the show as Nerd Numbers. That's why I had to resign. And then, uh, Brian, you can find on Twitter as Box Score Brian. Hope you have a good week and hope your team makes the playoffs.